Uh, it's a pleasure to see everybody. Thank you, everybody, for joining me. Um, the uh, the book is the third edition of my uh, book, Unified Philosophy, which I began writing. Actually, um, believe it or not, when I was uh, when I was a senior in high school and a freshman in college, where I. Uh, disagreed with liberal arts. When I first heard of liberal arts, I disagreed with it. And um, uh, I got then into uh, the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. And suddenly the way he wrote, uh, I love the way he wrote and I began to agree with liberal arts. And uh, um, I found myself going into philosophy because I like to ask questions People have criticized me to, saying, you ask questions which can't be answered. Uh, the more I got into philosophy, uh, I realized eventually that it deals with what we call today soft skills. Uh, skills that are common and basic to any job and any human activity and which uh, are foundations of uh, any kind of uh, specialization. Uh, and uh, uh, as I was uh, teaching this uh, years ago, I realized that I should have a, um, I, I made a presentation on a PowerPoint and one of the people there said, um, uh, you know, you should write this in normal, common, easy English. And that's where my PowerPoint comes in. The, the PowerPoint is about the book, the chapters, 16 chapters in the book, but it's in uh, what I hope to be easy English. Uh, awesome. So um, next, yes, this is the back cover of the book. Um, and um, I should say that I'm very deeply influenced uh, by interdisciplinarity, uh, by ethics, and by what we call in ergonomics um, user-friendly thinking. Uh, and um, I find that that's been a very, very big um, influence on me with ergonomics. Uh, people have heard of the ergonomic chair, the ergonomic car, and so forth. Yes. And uh, so I have found ergonomics to be uh, really uh, uh, a way of looking at uh, philosophy. Uh, ne next uh, slide. Thank you. Soft skills are basic to hard skills. Soft skills, I mean, that we're translating 16 philosophical ideas relevant for uh, lifelong learning, everyday life, and work. Uh, hard skills um, are specific skills for cooking, law, physics, math, carpentry, and being an electrician, and baking. Uh, skills of white and blue collar work. So, uh, uh, people ask, do we go on to college or even high school and are we to learn hard skills or soft skills? Well, hard skills are the ones that help you build something. For example, these are my glasses and my glasses required uh, the optician's hard skill of knowing how to, uh, how to make glasses. Okay. However, the uh, optician has to arrive on work on time, has to be honest, has to have a work ethic, has to know how to deal with material. And there is a soft skill in this because, as everybody knows, we have glasses here, which I can wear uh, like this, but you will also notice that uh, um, at some point in the history of glasses recently, uh, people started wearing contact lenses. So uh, being, uh, being able to develop contact lenses is a soft skill because you're thinking. Uh, you're thinking uh, not so much how to build uh, and be competent in building glasses, but is there an alternative to wearing glasses? Well, yes, there is. There are contact lenses, and therefore that would be a soft skill. Okay, next So one. innovation is a soft skill. 
yes, innovation and openness and uh, uh, ability to learn from other people is a soft skill. Any job needs soft skills, listening, respect for employer and employee, uh, justice, being a part of the community, social <laughs> skills and thinking are of course social, all are part of being a human uh, in lifelong learning in a 20 minute neighborhood. Uh, I, um, 20 minute neighborhood uh, has become a very favorite subject of mine. It means uh, uh, living within walking or bicycling distance uh, no more than 20 or 30 minutes from other institutions. So if you can um, walk to the grocery, uh, walk to your work, walk here, walk there, you live in a 20 minute neighborhood. I grew up in two 20 minute neighborhoods in Chicago. And um, if you absolutely need mass transportation or a car, to travel 20 miles a day, 30 miles, 40 miles a day, that's not a 20 minute neighborhood. It's more like a two or three hour uh, uh, neighborhood. And uh, uh, one of the people in city hall today uh, who the mayor has brought in uh, with her uh, uh, was Maurice Cox. Maurice Cox is an advocate of the 20 minute neighborhood. I had never heard of the word 20 minute neighborhood uh, until they talked about uh, Maurice Cox coming here. He's with urban development uh, department. And when I heard of 20 minute neighborhood, I thought, hey, you know, I, I grew up in two of them. Uh, one was on Erie Street in Chicago and one was um, in Lathrop Holmes where I grew up on the uh, Northwest side. So the 20 minute uh, neighborhood is, it's very practical. So you're saying practical it, also falls in the soft skills category? Yeah, yes. Uh, the 20 minute neighborhood is, uh, falls in the uh, soft skills because what you're asking here has nothing to do with your profession. Uh, what you're asking here is where do I live? And we're gonna see this in one of the chapters of my book. Where do I live? Uh, answering that question, asking that question is a soft skill because we all have to live somewhere. So are you going to live uh, a 30 or 40 minute L ride to your job or somewhere else or your church? Or are you going to try to uh, uh, walk there? Uh, actually, 99% um, of my college teachers live literally across the street from our college. I went to North Park College in Chicago and I learned very quickly in like my first week that all of my teachers actually live literally in the neighborhood. Now, uh, these numbers one, two, three, and four, uh, each of them deals with a particular chapter um, and numbers one and two deal with logic and emotion. So uh, just look at one, two, three, and four. Um, uh, I could ask Stan or anyone there, does anyone see a pattern uh, in these four chapters? I'm just curious. Either all or nothing. Yes, yes. In each of them, um, we can say number, uh, in number one, for example, computers only would be logic only. Humane computing would be lo emotion-based logic. No computing would mean no logic at all, only emotion. Uh, and so what you can say is uh, number one, uh, uh, computers only and no computing are extremes. Number two, uh, 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 rather human computing would be ergonomic in the sense that uh, it is uh, user-friendly or humane-friendly computing. So do you use only computers? Uh, do you ever think uh, or- uh, oh, I sometimes no use my fingers, Michael. I sometimes okay, count you, on my fingers. Yes, if you can- if you Is that can humane use computing? Fingers, 
that would be number that would be humane computing <laughs> because you're using your <laughs> body you're using your fingers as opposed to using a keyboard uh, if you absolutely have to use a calculator or the keyboard then you're saying i need technology i absolutely need technology that would be num uh, that would be computers only um, in number two are we um, flesh and bones alone uh, or are we dignified flesh and bones or are we no flesh and bones? So oh. here in chapter two, <coughs> me, um, we also have an interpretation of logic and emotion. And so flesh and bones only would be pure logic. And guess where that leads? That leads to automation yeah that leads to uh ai that leads to the fact that um the doctor that treats you lacks bedside manners yeah well also during the pandemic of course we were all flesh and bones only so we all experienced uh, that yeah just about yes we yes. all experienced that directly we, we're all on zoom and uh, <laughs> so flesh and bones only means electronics only uh, logic only and only Zoom. And then you have the opposite of flesh and bones only and that, that's no flesh and bone. Now, no flesh and bone would be, um, if you will, spirit alone or spirituality alone and have no concept really of the outside world. So in no flesh and bone, you have what uh, scholars have called the world rejecting ascetic. And the world rejecting ascetic is someone who says, uh, we don't have a body, we don't need the body, the body is evil, and therefore our, um, no flesh and bone would be the equivalent of living in a monastery yeah, where a monk. You, you, you have no contact with anyone. Uh, number three, chapter three, God alone, the personal God and no God. And um, another way of looking at this, by the way, is when you look at the second, um, the second line in each of these chapters, it would be ergonomic. So in number three, God alone would be pantheism, where God is everywhere, but the person does not count. Uh, in personal God, uh, the person counts and God is communicating with the person. And in no God, you have the person alone. Um, every every uh, philosophy book has a uh, chapter on God and religion. And uh, so you have God alone as pantheism. Uh, personal God would be the historical God. Um, and no God would be atheism, agnosticism. Also in there, you would have polytheism. There's no real personal God. Polytheism um, and um, henotheism, where mm -hmm. one God is the highest God, but you also have other gods. Number four, uh, state alone, democr uh, democratic state, and no state. If you have the state alone, uh, you have a dictatorship, you have what we would have too big government, uh, any kind of tyranny where the individual doesn't count. And the exact opposite is no state where you have anarchy. So the ergonomic approach, as I pointed out in my book, is the democratic state where uh, you have citizen engagement in the state and where you have, well, freedom of speech and uh, uh, you are free to criticize your government. In state alone, you may not criticize the government. In no state, there is no government. So, you, so we know where we are in that category also then. <laughs> yes, uh, so, uh, yes, yeah. yes. Ah, okay. Uh, number five, urban sprawl urban planning, and nothing urban. Well, Chicago, 
uh, New York City, LA, uh, the major cities of the world uh, are under urban sprawl because in urban sprawl, you have unlimited numbers of people, you have unlimited uh, distances between people, you definitely don't have the 20 minute neighborhood. Uh, one example of urban sprawl is the high rise. And uh, we have the example of that, the recent um, address of one Chicago, I think it is, uh, at Chicago and uh, State where you have that uh, high rise uh, that used to be a parking lot. That would be an example of urban sprawl because what you have is people live, the so-called um, people living on top of each other. And uh, that's a good way to spread illnesses because you don't have uh, a neighborhood setting. The exact opposite of urban sprawl would be no urban. And no urban would be an example of the monastery where um, everything literally is in the monastery. The diet is very, very simple. Rice, beans, and whatever. Uh, you're, you're, um, you don't have a regular diet and you don't have a regular community. Um, in urban planning, you have um, the 20-minute neighborhood, and uh, you uh, you have a, a planned environment where you have limited growth and limited technology. Uh, number six is very, very interesting because if you have mere work, what you're doing is um, reducing work to motion and technology. So an example of mere work would be throwing everybody out of work, having mere machines and having simply automation and computer work. So the next time you go into a, uh, into a business and you're gonna check out, you're gonna buy something and you check out, are you gonna pay a cashier? or are you gonna have a self-checkout? And uh, the self-checkout would be mere work because all you're doing is giving money to something and you're taking your product out of the establishment. You're not dealing with people. Um, the exact opposite of that would be no work and if you look at chapter five above, no urban. No urban means would be a monastery. And what do you do in a monastery? Well, you're essentially praying all day. You're essentially simply communing with people. There is absolutely no uh, uh, work in that uh, sense. What is humane work? A human work, um, which is between mere work and no work, human work would be that every job has to be meaningful. And you, what you're doing is having work as a human activity. So now uh, uh, we uh, frequently say, you know, uh, the politician will say, uh, we have to create jobs. Well, okay but are, are you creating mere automation jobs or are you creating jobs for people uh, who will be working themselves? Number seven kind of follows for number six. Chapter seven, uh, I love this one because mere communication versus no communication versus communal communication. So what is mere communication? Well, that's carrying your uh, mobile with you everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, mere communication would be mere texting, mere email, uh, using only Zoom, uh, using only technology. So mere communication would be data and it would be uh, 
anything that is impersonal. Communal communication would mean uh, that people actually talk to each other. Uh, and people uh, will use uh, telecommunication, but only in a very limited sense. And in no communication, you again come close to the monastery where you don't communicate with anyone outside the monastery. Um, um, I was in my full-time job when I, when I was working full-time, <clears throat> I was in a building and um, I noticed that you know, there, uh, down the hall there was a, a wall and there were two people sitting on the floor. Each one, th they were maybe uh, 40 feet apart. They were both were using either email or text. They both had cell phones or mobiles. And I just stood there wondering um, if they were ever going to look at each other. It turned mm -hmm. out one of them looked at the other and said, oh, you're there. You're here sitting next to me. And it turned out that they were communicating with each other without ever knowing that they were next to each other. And uh, I happened to bump into an IT guy who came by and I said, you're not gonna believe what I'm gonna tell you. He said, I'll believe anything. Well, I told him what just happened. He said, yeah. He said, we have people who are oblivious to the real world. Um, and when, when they're sitting like that, they, they don't even know that they're texting someone who is like 50 or 60 feet away. Um, Michael, I email people all the time who are sitting right next to me. That's 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 a common practice. <laughs> do it all the time. Yes. Well, when you say communicate, mean in person or by by texting? I send people at work an email who are sitting next to me. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I I have worked in a situation where. My supervisor is roughly uh, oh, 50 feet away in her office. My supervisor and I would be talking. He says, oh, put that in an email and send it to me. And I'm thinking, can I write that down on a piece of paper and hand it to you? He says, no, send it to me by email. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. Well, we can discuss that more, but that's, so that might be an example where it's not necessarily a bad practice, but if we're aware of the practice and that it's... Uh... It's cutting into the soft skills quotient yeah. of the of our life, then that's somewhat problematic. Yes. Uh, well, soft skills would be learn how to have interpersonal communication. Yes. Another another soft skill would be uh, if you own property, uh, is is um, are we going to have near public property, uh, no public property, or private? public property, the soft skill would say, uh, what kind of property do you own? Or do you own any private property? If you have mere private property, that becomes pure logic. Uh, everybody owns uh, either nothing or everybody is owned by the state. Um, well, that's pure logic in the sense that uh, people are going to be deprived of having um, an emotional relationship, a private relationship to their property. If you have no public property, that becomes purely emotional, that becomes anarchic, and therefore uh, you could say that there's no logic uh, to that. Next one. Uh, okay, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, in philosophy, we have the theory of knowledge. How do we get knowledge? And uh, instead of using a big word like uh, epistemology, I will use uh, the softer word, uh, nurture and nature. And regardless of your job, regardless of who you are, um, do, how do you know? Well, you can say you have nurture alone or the exact opposite, which would be no nurture. Uh, believe it or not, a very easy way of learning epistemology then 
in nurture alone, you have pure logic where uh, you have a uh, person only learning through experience and therefore it's the sum total of data. Data and logic come in and in nurture alone, it's only by computers. Uh, whereas no nurture would mean pure nature and an example of that is, regardless of who you are, a soft skill would be, do you have, as a human being, any innate knowledge, any innate ability to learn? The example of no nurture would be the genius, uh, the genius or the uh, very talented person or the gifted child. Uh, an example of nurture alone, by the way, would be the very passive person <clears throat> the slow learner, um, uh, do you have to repeat something to somebody constantly? Well, yes, I admit that. There I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Michael? Pardon? Uh, could you repeat that, please? Yes. I'm just kidding. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so in, in No Nurture, you have the genius who... Um, Believe it or not, it does need nurture, but we would say, how did you learn calculus at the age of three? Well, they had the uh, inherent ability, uh, but no nurture can be quite emotional, whereas nurture alone would be pure logic. Nurture through nature would be, I, I would say, what, what occurs with 90% uh, of the people, and it's very ergonomic. Okay, well, we're going to come back to that in question and answers because I've completely lost the number nine. We'll come back to that one. Okay. On okay. Red tape. Uh, number... I'm, a, I'm a slow learner, Michael, apparently. Oh, oh, oh. Well, in that case, so am I. Sorry about that. Yeah, I saw my. Tell us about the red tape. Okay. Uh, number 10. Uh, red tape, uh, bureaucracy, anything that is very, very complicated, far too complicated. The opposite of that is no tape, and it is only the handshake. Uh, in a communal setting, in a monastery setting, we have, you know, are you going to live in urban sprawl? Are you going to live in a humane city, or are you going to live in a monastery? Well, in a monastery, we have no tape, period. We have no signs and nothing to learn. It's uh, just interpersonal communication. Everything is simplistic. Whereas in the humane city, you have tape through the handshake. Uh, in red tape, you never believe anyone, never trust anyone. The red tape is where you have signs alone. And that brings us to 11, where you have signs alone um, versus no signs or in between you have signs through belief. Uh, by the way, number 10 would be uh, the concept of philosophical truth. Number 11 would be truth theories. So we're simplifying here. In science alone, you have the big city where you never know really anything in the bureaucracy. You always have to ask who does what and who's responsible for what and where do I go, what do I do? If you go to big city hall, ask a federal government, you're asking, who do I contact? If you have to ask that too frequently, it is a distortion of soft skills and you are living in an environment that is not ultimately humane. Uh, science well, through- We know yeah, that, Michael. Yeah. We know that part. <laughs> We know that part. <laughs> yes. And in science through belief, you have uh, you have bureau versus bureaucracy. So you have simplicity uh, in science through belief. In no science, well, again, uh, the monastery. In number 12, uh, we have the philosophical concept of linguistic analysis. Should we have clarity alone? Well, clarity alone means mathematical language, no humor, no emotion, logic alone. So in clarity alone, uh, if we all spoke in clarity alone, I don't think we'd get very far because clarity alone means only logic. 
uh, clarity through idiom, however, is logic through emotion, logic through humor. So joking around is very human. Joking around, no clarity. No clarity would mean you have only joking and only humor, which, you know, I can't imagine clarity alone. I can't imagine a life that has no clarity in it. Uh, and finally, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Um, disciplines alone, disciplines through philosophy and no disciplines. Um, an example of disciplines alone would be today where we have a proliferation of the information explosion. Uh, so an example of disciplines alone would be the internet. In the internet, uh, you know, people say you can find anything you want. Well, you know, there's also untruth in the internet too. There are things that are not true on the internet. Uh, disciplines through philosophy, which means that you have to give some philosophical coherence two uh, two uh, disciplines. Disciplines alone would be logic alone. No disciplines would be emotion alone. So where would you have no disciplines? Well, you go to the monastery. In the monastery, in the world rejecting ascetic, you have pure emotion and you have no real scientific knowledge of the world and where the emphasis only would be on uh, koans or prayers or poetry. So in number, in disciplines alone, you have just about no poetry, uh, only logic, and no disciplines would be only poetry and no logic. Inside disciplines, 14, technology alone, well, automation, only technology, only logic. A soft skill would be, um, do you choose technology alone? Do you choose technology through art and science? Or do you choose no technology? If you choose no technology, uh, you're not going to survive too long. Uh, if you have no technology, you're going to be not only rural, but you're gonna be living in the forests and technology alone would mean only automation, only logic. Um, in 15, a corollary, a corollary to that, uh, science alone, which means logic alone, or no science, pure art and pure emotion. Or do you have uh, science through art, which means uh, emotion or art-based logic. So in um, uh, the writer C.P. Snow says he, uh, he, he uh, lamented the fact that we have uh, the two cultures. We have scientists and we have artists and they don't talk to each other. Um, and in science through art, you have logic, which is manifest through, um, through emotion. Finally, chapter 16, uh, a soft skill would ask, uh, do we logically control everything? Do we predict everything? Uh, or at the exact opposite, do we predict nothing? Well, you know, if you predict nothing, you have no idea what you're gonna to do tomorrow and you have no idea how to go about doing it. That's not good. So the average person probably lives with number two, that means prediction right. through uh, prediction through emotion. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, uh, but, yeah. well, but so in the topic, I mean, you really did a great job explaining that you know all of life, humanity is most of it is in the soft skills category. That's what we experience, but we are in this logic matrix. So, what is the big takeaway here between? logic and emotion. I mean, our values and social norms are all geared toward logical, like everything we do is logical and we value things that are logical, but we're really having an experience that's more emotional based. So how do we, how do we navigate that in a world that 
I mean, I think I'm safe to say, I think you're saying that we're becoming more, more logic based, more hard skills, but yet we, we're a soft skilled species. So how do we reconcile this? Unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, um, uh, uh, it, the more we go into having computers and logic overwhelm us, it would be very important to have the soft skill of um, trying to uh, uh, put computers and automation and logic in their place, which today is very, very difficult. Uh, and uh, as a matter of fact, I heard um, one, uh, one person say once that one day we may have, well, the self-driving car, which is an automated car, but I also heard someone say many years ago, uh, are we going to have uh, trains and elevated uh, buses and so forth in cities without motormen, without people driving it? Is it only going to be through computers? Uh, so unfortunately, uh, that seems to be uh, almost a, um, uh, a juggernaut in which logic is overwhelming emotion, which is not good. Uh, and um, uh, well, but that's like I, in the uh, in the Stanley Kubrick film. That's what happened in, in two thousand one, A Space Odyssey, right? That the computer decided that it was smarter than humanity, and the best way it could serve humanity was to eliminate humanity. Is that ultimately yeah. where we're heading? Or we're, yeah, well, I would say where we're heading, but that's where that yeah. thinking would lead you eventually. Right. Right. As a matter of fact. People. It, it's sort of very disconcerting when I read um, journals in technology and in computers and they say, hey, you know, we're going to try to build the smartest computer there is. We're going to have the quantum computer, which can do anything, anywhere. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, you're the one developing the computer. Once you have that, uh, are you saying you're going to step away and die? What, what are you going to do? Why have the most um, highly sophisticated computer? So what? Uh, what? What is that going to prove? Precisely nothing. Um, as a matter of fact, there's been um, uh, many, many years ago, I was talking to a, a military official, and he said, you know, some people are thinking, put all nuclear launches strictly on a computer. And, you know, uh, that would be catastrophic because they're try many many people are trying to have zero human intervention well you know zero human intervention um, can be uh, a very good way of eliminating uh, civilization yes michael that's that's another stanley kubrick film altogether but we're going to take some questions in the next half but i want to thank you because uh, we are going to end well, our recording my pleasure but I want to thank you again for uh, for sharing all this. It's a tremendous amount of information <laughs> consolidated into a into a small and concise presentation. I know we'll have some answers, but uh, some questions. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.